We're gonna fall this bad boy. It's about 70, maybe 65 feet tall. But I, if we cleared out, we always look for nails and stuff like that because this tree is going to get milled later. And if it's going to get milled, we want to do whatever we can to help protect the mill. But here's a nail we couldn't get out uh, comfortably with the tools that we have. So just make sure that we put some paint on there. This guy's just about dead. And once we get paint on there, then we know that uh, um, somebody might see it when it comes down to doing the milling later. So I'm gonna fall this and uh, we'll see if we can get it right in position. We rarely get a chance to fall trees. Um, I think this one's gonna twist, but I'm trying to protect that cedar. So if you wanna see, scan over to that guy, I'm trying to protect him and put it right in between this big leaf maple and cedar. Um, it's, it's weighted right, so I'm not worried about that. There's no wind right now, which is great. And I feel confident that it'll go where I want it to, but I feel like it's also gonna have a propensity to twist. So that's just based on the foliage. So the foliage is heavy on this side, so it's probably gonna pull it that way. So what I'm likely to do is send it straight for this, uh, just to the right, excuse me, just to the left of this big leaf maple. We'll see if that will take it. As a backup, because there's no rope in this tree, I always want to have some wedges and something to strike with real close by, ready to go. Obviously, I would make sure before I do any cutting that my whole space is cleared out, which it is already. But if I was following this in a place where there was blackberries or brambles or ivy or anything, I would want to clean out a nice space. So I'm really comfortable for falling because anything can happen. And if something does go wrong, I got to be able to escape. So I need a way of escape here, the weight of the tree and everything else, anywhere this direction would be my way of escape. And so I'm looking to that path to keep it clear. I let the people know that I'm working with, Hey, this is a place to keep clear. A uh, couple of things I do ahead of time, my customers, because there's a house right here, I want to make sure that if they have any dogs that they've already let them out and then brought them back into a safe place that are not out running around because dogs literally will run right up to you in the middle of chainsawing. They just don't, you know what I mean? They, they're, uh, they're happy. So they're happy to help if they can. Anyway, so we'll get to chopping on this guy. <clears throat> we'll see if we can put it where we want it. We're gonna talk about a face cut. So if you won't be able to hear me over the chainsaw, my face cut, I'm gonna want and shoot for a minimum of 20% of the depth of the total portion of the tree, but I usually will go 30%. And I'm gonna use a Humboldt notch uh, because this is gonna be used for uh, milling. And so when I use a Humboldt notch, I'm gonna have a relatively flat base and that'll be an easier place to work from if I have a different type of notch it'll take out a nice chunk of this bigger section which is what I want and normally you fall as low as you can but this sand in this soil this soil is uh, you know very sandy and rain and things like that will splash up sand into this portion of the bark so I'm probably gonna fall it up in here and yeah I'm gonna waste a little bit of wood but it's just not that serious you know we're not getting paid by the foot or anything so I'm gonna follow it up in here, maybe even up in here where it's a little bit more comfortable to get a gauge and where I can be comfortable where I'm working. So I'm gonna do a Humboldt notch about a third of the way into the, the material. And then I'm gonna start with my back cut. And what I'll always do is leave a little bit of material the way I want it to turn. So if I'm going for any turning, I'll have the face and as I come in, if I want it to turn this way, I'll come in at an angle pointed that direction, which makes a lot of sense. So you can use that, the handles of your saw as you're aiming. So if I come in at any sort of an angle, it's gonna leave more of a hinge on that side, causing the tree to turn the direction that I leave the hinge on. So that's basically all you wanna know is just go straight in, the saw blade going straight in with the cut, the direction you want it to go. 
and you usually be really safe as long as you made your hinge appropriately. So as I'm doing the hinge, it's the same thing. I'm gonna aim with my handles of my saw. It's a good way to do it. Look down the straight portion of the side handle of your saw and use that as the way you gauge where you're gonna put your face. So I'm gonna put a face in and we're gonna follow it and we'll try to get it all in one take if we can so you get to see it start to finish. I'm gonna be using a Husky. This is a 365. If you don't know what those mean on numbers, they're different for lots of different brands. The three is the generation. So the very first number is a generation. It's the third generation of saw. So that means with all of the different things they came up with, the third generation is the third prototype, if you will, of type of saw that we have. And the 65 is your CC. So 365, 65 CCs. This is a 24 inch bar, which is more than enough to take care of what I'm doing here. This is probably 18 inches across at the widest. So I have plenty of room to make my cut. Um, you can fall a much bigger tree with a small saw, but it, it takes a little bit more work and you gotta be really careful how you finish your cut. So your back cut is so important when you're falling a tree, you wanna make sure you're using a appropriate saw. If you have a big enough saw, Use one that's a little bit bigger than your cut and you'll be a lot safer that way. It makes it much easier to gauge. You're gonna see after I do my face cut, I'm gonna make some little relief cuts on each side. That's not to keep it from barber chairing. I'm not concerned with that. Those relief cuts help me get and make sure that I'm going right into the kerf of my hinge because I wanna be a nice straight into my hinge I use those relief cuts to kind of give me a gauge to aim. And as some guys will go straight into the cut, I usually come in with just a slight slope, very slight slope, because I find that makes it easier when I go to wedge. So I don't go straight in, I go in at just a teeny bit of a slope, and that's not much, it's very, very, you might not even notice it. But that's something that I have a tendency to do because I find it works a little bit better for aiming. So here we have to aim. It's very important. I'm not just following this tree, so that'll be a big portion of what we're doing. So on the Huskies, you gotta choke them. And one thing you wanna know, same thing with Echo, is make sure it's on. If you pull this handle a couple of times, you'll easily flood it, and it might take you a few minutes to get everything going.
the tenancy. And you can see the foliage now of the trees on the ground. The foliage is all on this side. That tendency for it to twist this direction is why I left such a heavy hinge on this side. So this heavy hinge, you can see how I came in. I left that heavy amount of hinge here and that pulled the tree the direction I wanted it to go. So if you saw when it was originally falling, it was falling just like this, but that hinge did all the work of pulling it over. We missed this other tree, almost perfect. I don't know if you guys caught that last part where it hit, but it just went right into position. So this was like perfect. I got my heart even going because it was just landed just right. But that's what we're going for. We're going for that twist. So it's right in position and we'll get to bucking this up. But that was just a quick, you know, kind of give you guys an idea. And this is a smaller tree, but as you get bigger, it's the same thing, just in a, just bigger saws, bigger, you know, bigger cuts. But really, you guys got a good example right there. So I'm really glad that worked out. And we'll check in as we get finished up with this. We're gonna take out this bad boy right here. And this is really what they called us for. Anybody could fall this tree, but not everybody can take this tree out, you know, 10 feet away from a porch. So it's uh, something we'll be working on next. On this one, because it's uh, weirdly weighted and tipped back a little bit, um, this big leaf maple would protect it. But if it falls in between these two, there's a whole bunch of things that could get damaged on the other property. So we're going to use a two to one up in this tree to fall it over the top of this other one right here in the middle. And uh, the main reason for the two to one, um, I'm working with Ryan Gill today. You've already seen him in other videos. He's doing the video right now, but uh, he could easily pull this over with just, just hand strength. But the problem is, is we're limited. There's a creek right there. We just fell the tip of this tree over the creek. That creek right there, we, we can't have somebody backing into a creek. So when we put up a two to one, that gives us the ability to pull the same direction that we want it to go. So the tree's gonna get and pulled the right direction, but he can be way over here doing the pulling in a safe area. Plus it gives them more strength. So you get an advantage of 50% each pull time you go through a pulley. The only difference is you have to pull further to get the same amount of work done. So right here, one to one, whatever I pull, I get exactly that same amount. Two to one, I gotta pull a little bit more to get that same amount of work, but I'm able to do more work strength wise because of the pulley. So if I can pull 200 pounds, maybe 300, super strong. If I can pull 300 pounds, let's say, because well, most people actually can pull 300 pounds. If I can pull 300 pounds regularly, once it goes through a pulley, now I can pull 450 pounds. Go through another pulley, now I can do 50% of that. So 50% of 450 is another 225. So that means I'm able to do 675, is that right? My math is bad sometimes. Now I'm able to pull 675, and that's a considerable amount of weight, especially when we shoot a line up about two thirds of height of the tree. So we'll pause it for now. We'll check in in a minute once we get that line set up. That part's really easy. We're just gonna shoot a line up into the tree. We're gonna pull up our, our rigging line. We're gonna lock it off. We're gonna set up the two to one. I think we'll put that on video. I think it's such a useful tool to have when you guys are doing this kind of stuff, it's rare that we get to do logging like this. We're normally like in a tiny little backyard, you know, and everything has to be perfect. This, we have a little bit more room to do some fun stuff. So we'll check in here in a minute and we'll see if you get a chance to see that. We're getting ready to set up our two to one. Technically it's three to one, but it doesn't matter. We're gonna, but we're only using two pulleys, so a lot of times we'll refer to that as a two to one, when technically it is a three to one. The pulling person and each pulley, all three of those things are pulling against the tree. So it's three different pulling positions against the tree. So it's technically a three to one. But, uh, so I've shot up a line into the tree and then fished the town on the other side. 
And the only thing to know with this type of tree is you can see it's co-dominant. And I want to stay away from that crack in between the two stems. And if you want to zoom in and see that, it's a real sharp, sharp place there where it would easily catch ropes. So I'm way up above that. And I also want to be, if I can, two thirds the distance of the tree. It gives me a good place to start from. So as you've seen before with climbing, the only difference here is we're sending up a rigging rope. And I want to get a good three wraps on it. So if there's an issue, I can pull it back down and not lose it. So I've got three wraps right here. Dress them and set them. I'm gonna be pulling pretty hard on it, so I really wanna set it nice. And what I'm going for is one of those uh, leaders is more dominant than the other. And that's the one I want to get a hold of. That's my goal. You get onto that more dominant one, which is the one on the right hand side. And you can tell when you look at the trunk, the more dominant picks up a higher portion of that crease. And it's just pretty obvious. And here you can see it's a good reason to wrap it three times because my first wrap popped off, but I was able to get it out with the two underneath. So there we go. We got our rope set up. Now I can work up a slip knot or what I find more, more convenient is a carabiner. And I know there's kind of a split in this field specifically is free tying knots as opposed to uh, rigging carabiners. And I'm a rigging carabiner kind of guy. I'm gonna use an anchor hitch. Now, the cool thing about an anchor hitch, the way you wind and set your rope can put your tail end the direction you want it. So if I wind this way and I set it this way, my tail end's gonna be upper. So I'm gonna go down instead of up. Wrap around the standing end, back up through, and as long as I have a nice tail, at least my hand's width, I don't have to have a stopper knot in this hitch. That's probably one of the reasons I like it the most. And when you're dealing with gates on carabiners and other things, I have a real smooth area that's big enough to hold the rope. So I can tuck it down into the bottom. This guy's out of my way. He's not ever gonna get in front of the gate and cause a problem with getting it on and off because sometimes you're gonna be opening and closing this multiple times. So I'm confident in my knot. I've dressed and set it. I'm gonna get it on here. And I gotta back up quite a ways because I've got to clear some of these branches. Not ideal because I didn't clear all those branches and I wouldn't be able to physically because there's too many of them they're, they're gonna be too strong but once we get our system set up we should be able to break those pretty easy plus once we have this three to one, two to one set up, the tip of the tree went off into the ditch. There's a creek down there, the, steeps, the slope's really steep, and we can't get that out because the branches are drove down in and there's no way to get down around it to cut it free. So we're gonna use our three to one to hopefully pick that up out of the ditch later. It's just another thing we can use it for 
gives us a working advantage. So I'm pretty confident with this. My only dilemma is I think it's gonna hurt this tree. We're okay to hurt this tree, but we don't want to. So when I fall it, I still have to come around this maple, but if I can, I wanna try and save this tree as much as possible. So we'll work on that. So I've used a quarter wrap setup on the base of the tree. It's real sandy here, so I wanna watch out. And I'm gonna set up this. This is my first position. It's really not necessary, but for some reason I always feel better if I timber hitch the rest of my gear whenever I'm doing this. This is overkill, but when you're dealing with big, uh, big stuff, it really just makes you feel more comfortable. At least once around. And I like to put a loop in back where there's going to be some friction and carry the tail through. Basically a modified half hitch and that cinches down on itself once there's some weight applied. Makes me feel better. By itself it would do the job. It's not letting anything out of here but you feel a lot better when you're safer like that. All right. So now I like to take the rope to give me the most advantage. Take the rope down as low as I can. And I made a mistake. I should have brought my, hold on. I should have brought my rope with me. Hi ho, hi ho. much pull as we can get. I've seen people set this up too close to where they're pulling from and they run out of that room in between really fast. You want to have a lot of room as much as possible. That's why I'll even come in and reach up as high as I can. And we also have to remember we've got some slack up there that we've got to retrieve. <clears throat> So I tie a lot of knots, but I don't tie them all. So if you see me make a mistake, be sure to correct me. It could be saving my life. Butterfly, loop into double over. I don't really need to clip this in yet because I'm still gonna have to beat my rope through. I just want to make sure that it's straight. The pulley is going to be able to go, but I look down the rope and I like it to be straight, just so I know nothing can go wrong. And I'll set up my other pulley and clip it to my butterfly. Same thing every time with a knot, dress, set, make sure you're comfortable. Now I've just increased my pulling power and we'll see if I have enough to take the slack out of that rope and get those branches out of there. So go ahead and look up there and we'll see if I'm able to. I wasn't able to break them all the way before with just my own strength, but now we could almost pull the tree over by itself. All right, so that's good enough. That's gonna take us where we wanna go. And this is something I wanna talk about. If somebody was pulling this rope just connected to the tree, there really isn't a lot of room to work with. There's not a lot of room to escape. My back is against this ditch right here. Yeah, I could dive down in there, but I don't wanna to have to. Doing it this way, I could not only pull from right here, it'll change the angle a slight amount, but I could also take off down this field and work this way. And because of my anchor, it'll still pull it the direction I want it to go. 
and it makes me in a safer position. I'm gonna be over here somewhere, much safer than if I'm straight in line with the tree. And I can be back far enough with enough rope to know that my tip's not gonna come down and get me. All right, so we're pretty close to set up. I think I'll just set the camera aside and let you guys see that come out of there. And if we do it right, I'm gonna try and aim and not hurt this cedar. We'll see, but we'll see, I'll let you guys take a look at that. All right, so that went really close to as planned. You can see we whacked a couple of branches in the cedar, but we didn't break it. And the tree, you know, one of the tops kind of went into the lilac a little bit. We're not super upset with that. That is really close to exactly what we're looking for. If it had been like three or four feet further our direction, it would have been absolutely perfect but everything went the way we wanted it to. He was real safe back here, pulling that three to one, and this 70 foot tree didn't hurt him. So we'll check in again here pretty quick if we got something else for you. All right, so we just took that tree down that we two to one, and we've got all the gear out, and we were able to get that top out before by hand because it's just too locked into the, the ground. We still might not be able to, but what I did is I just reversed the two to one and set the block up on two webbing straps on the next tree we're gonna take out. And then we'll see if I'm able to pull it out of there real quick, or at least move it more than it was. And this is just for fun, but I mean, you've already got it out. It only takes another minute to reset it. Yeah, it's locked in there pretty good. I'm not sure this is the advantage I need anyway. I think it would be better opposite, but still, that isn't coming out of there. It's locked in pretty good. Well, it wasn't much help. We weren't able to pull it out of there with the two to one. I think that wasn't the good way to do it. I might have set it up wrong. There's an easier way to set it up to where it's not, you're not working as hard. And going downhill, you're kind of driving the rope into the ground so that makes it a little bit more difficult but we were able to using the pressure of the rope on it to keep it from rolling off over the hill we were able to get around it and get it up out of there so that's good now we're just cleaning up the mess from these first two trees and then we'll get up into this beast and take it out over the top of the house and we'll check in then Hey, this commercial is brought to you by our sponsor, Arbor Now, drink water. So I'm goofing around, but it really is a big deal. So stay hydrated whenever you're working, especially this physical outdoor work that we do. Uh, even when it gets colder out, the first place to suffer when you're dehydrated is your brain. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. I've got to pump fluids in my body up to the highest point, And that's one of the first places to suffer. You'll see guys getting headaches and they'll start to have problems as they get dehydrated. So hydrate yourselves and those energy drinks really don't help I use a couple of tea bags if I want a little extra kick during the day and I can usually get all the stuff I need that way but anyway don't forget drink your water All right, so we're at the base of our tree. You can see all of this, these holes and this damage. This is likely a red-headed woodpecker coming in, pecking a hole, getting to the grubs that are inside and eating them. And you can tell when you put your ear close to this tree, you can hear all the little cracking and chewing that the insects are doing just underneath the bark. Now it's possible that these grubs could kill this tree because they disrupt the circulatory system so much but it's more likely that these grubs are here because the tree was already unhealthy. So they normally attack unhealthy trees, but that's not always the case. 
And here's your culprit. This is the guy you're looking for. Whenever you see a beetle, any long beetles like this are almost always beetles that attack trees. And this beetle specifically, um, I'll try to remember its name, but I can't. But it's very, very brightly colored. It also lends to the fact that it's toxic if you eat it. So remember, when you're out here and you get hungry, don't eat the beetles. But as a grub, it's not toxic. So the uh, birds are going in after the grubs, but they don't eat the adults when they find them. That's just some stuff you gotta know as you're training to become an arborist. You gotta look for the signs and the problems and try and be able to describe them, try and be able to fix things like this. This would not be the case for microinjection. This is only removal. There is no other way to fix this problem um, and be safe for the environment. Removal is kind of the only way. Plus, when removed properly, you'll get rid of a lot of the grubs that would eventually turn into adults. This tree, I'll try to expose it later, is completely packed full of grubs, and they're doing a crazy job of just destroying the internal sections of the phloem. Once they chew through the phloem, they cause, they disrupt the circulatory system of the tree and make it to where the vascular tissue can no longer transport anything, and so it'll end up killing the root system and thereby killing the tree. So uh, we'll check in as we go into this tree and start taking it apart, but this should go relatively seamless because it's a, we have a pretty good drop zone. So we'll check in a little bit later. So I'm about 50 feet up the tree. My man Ryan Gill down here doing all the brush himself. This is uh, too big of a job for just two people. Um, but we've got all day and when I get down, I'm gonna be helping hustle the brush up there and do all the chipping. So that's that, but I still got quite a climb. This is actually a pretty decent sized tree. It's about at least a solid 90 feet looks like, just based on where I am so far. But uh, nice thing about having a little bit of space, this is pretty close to this deck, but as you can see by just that one little branch there, everything's sweeping in really nicely. And as long as I'm careful about how I drop these, they're real light branches. Even if they were to hit something, they wouldn't do any damage, but the customer plans to remove most of this deck anyway. So we'll, uh, we'll be okay with that. So we'll just keep working. I'll keep dropping limbs. Give him a, another minute to get this cleared a little bit and get back. All right, about 70 feet up now. And you can see there's a lot of debris all the way out to the truck. Now I've got about Maybe 30 feet to go. Right about, I would say right about 30, maybe 35 feet. So, you know, it's just kind of a guesstimation, but you can see where we're at so far. Branch is going well. So this is a good time. Um, once I get up a little bit higher, you can see this is Swiss cheese and it makes the bark tear away really easily uh, because it's basically perforated. And the problem is, is that I'm spurring out. And if I'm spurring out, that can make me feel really unstable and potentially fall. So that's when I go to my next system. So I just basically dress with a swivel locking carabiner, um, anchor hitch on the end, flip it around the tree, clip it back to itself. That's a nice girth hitch that's gonna protect me. Then I connect myself via the uh, unisender that I like to use by Rock Exotica. I can put it on and off anywhere I want. That's what I like. Anyway, now if anything happens, I can get down easily. Also, if another guy were to feed my line, this wouldn't happen on our site because we're not chipping right now, but if a guy were to feed my line in, I would be set apart from that and I could easily just clip off if I had to. If I saw what was going on, I was able to stop it because I've actually seen that happen once. Anyway, uh, two, another important thing is if I were to get hurt, and I think I've, saw, I've talked about this before, but I find it really comforting that I could get down with one hand. So if I needed to, I could bring my weight down onto the unisender, then lower with just one hand and come down. And that's really a lot because 
your hands are the most common thing to get injured while you're up here and if you can't use both of them and you can't tie a knot or do anything like that you can have problems descending and especially descending quickly so if you get injured and you're bleeding profusely you may not have the right equipment to cut off that bleeding and stop it you need to get down out of the tree as fast as possible um, it's much more difficult to rescue a climber who's climbing a spire like this as it is to rescue somebody who's in a broader canopy tree where there's more anchor points and more positions for another climber. Um, it's still doable, but uh, even in a safety situation, I would use something very similar to what I'm doing now. So anyway, check in as we get closer to the top, maybe get a video for you guys of it coming out.